Good morning. We're so glad you're here to worship with us on this beautiful, sunny morning. I love the warm weather. If you're a guest with us this morning, we'd love to welcome you in. And the best way to get to know you is to have you fill out a Connect card. It looks like this. It's the green card. Just fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. If you're joining us online, Click the link in the chat and it'll take you straight to this Connect card. Just fill out the information on there and also drop your eyes to the bottom of that Connect card. There's a place for prayer requests. We would love to come alongside you and lift you up in prayer. Our staff would love to have the privilege to pray for you. So please put your prayer request at the bottom of that Connect card. In the sanctuary, just walk on out and drop it in the offering box. If you're joining us online, click the submit button. Well, Easter is just around the corner and we have three events coming up. First is our Seder meal. Dr. David Teitelbaum will be leading that meal on Tuesday, April 12th. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to celebrate the Passover and experience what Jesus experienced on his earthly ministry here on earth. So if you would like to find out more information about that, you can go to the great room. My family and I have joined the Seder meal and we have learned so much about the Last Supper through each part of that meal. So consider attending the Seder meal. Secondly, we have Tenebrae. It's a Good Friday service and that's Friday, April 15th. There are two services, six and 7.30 and Tenebrae means the darkening. It's a great way to prepare your heart for Easter. Easter Sunday, the day when Jesus claimed victory over the grave. So consider coming to Tenebrae. And then finally, our Worldview Conference called Navigate is returning to Fort Worth on April 22nd and April 23rd. This is an opportunity for you to lean in deeper into a biblical worldview and consider inviting your friends and neighbor who, neighbors who are searching for truth. There's a wonderful place for you to get your answers to your questions. And finally, before we sing, Take a look inside your sermon notes. There are two sheets of paper. Hold on to those. Cody's going to refer to those during the sermon. We have a special surprise for you there. Let's start our service by singing together. Would you stand and get ready to worship? Well, good morning, church. We get to celebrate the King this morning, so let's sing loudly and boldly together. I'll sing them all back, sing them all back to you. I'll call you maker. You give life an eternal spark. I'll call you healer. Cause you can mend any broken heart. I'll call you faithful father. Cause you finish everything you start My soul was made to respond I know you by a thousand names And you deserve every single one You've given me a million ways To be amazed at what you've done you've done. 
forever the beginning and the end you are lord and servant you're the son of man you're the lion of judah you're the risen lamb you're the second adam here to lead us home you are yahweh's glory now revealed in flesh and bone you are ocean potter you will make a way you are dead defeated you have risen from the grave the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God. Nothing. 
turn shame into glory. You're the Without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died 
its breath till that stones move for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in Father, how could we not sing praises to you? How could we not lift the name of Jesus? You've been so, so good to us, so gracious, so generous, always in pursuit of us, your children, extending love and mercy when we don't deserve it. So God, we lift our voices in unity, proclaiming you are the one true God, the King forever. It's in your name we pray, amen. You may have a seat. Amen. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he deserves all of our praise and adoration. And we get to stand here and emphatically say our hearts belong to that King of kings and our treasures, they belong to that King of kings, the true King of kings. If you'd like to extend an offering of worship today through giving, you are welcome to do so by texting the keyword on the screen here, or you can drop an offering in the box or you could go on the website. If, if that's your act of worship today, we'd love to uh, have you su support the many ministries that Christ Chapel supports. Uh, today, we have a very special announcement. If you've been with us this uh, year at all, you know that our vision is to open the door for people to come to know this King of Kings. It's to be an open door for people to hear this name of Jesus Christ. And so we have a special announcement for you today that's going to add and see that vision come even more to fruition. Check this out. Josh Bailey, hello, my man. Hey, Cody. You ready for the musical announcement? I am. We're about to go live to the whole church, and I'm super excited for how this is going to be a great tool to continue our vision of reaching those in our own backyard. Remember, what's the one thing we agreed upon? Don't reveal what musical we're doing. Right. Be tight-lipped. Well, we're about to go live to the congregation, so here we go. In three, two, one. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel, and thanks for being here for our big announcement. I'm here with our traditional music ministry leader, Josh Bailey. So, Josh, take it away. Thanks, Cody. Today, we're going to talk about this year's big musical. Now, I can't tell you what it is just yet, but I can say it's totally free. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to show you how to register for a spot. Uh, just to recap, the Big Secret Musical is totally free. Josh. If you want to register for a spot. Josh. Hang on, Cody. There are layers to this. Josh, turn off your filter. Get the filter icon. Turn it off. Turn it off. Oh, uh, I'm trying. Okay, I didn't. Okay. Um, well. Do you have a soundboard? Uh, ignore this, everyone. Please ignore this. Uh, I promise I'm not an ogre.
If you've been at Christ Chapel, you know that we host a musical in the summer. It's our summer musical, and now you've seen the announcement is Shrek, which is a family-friendly, entertaining, uh, familiar type of musical so that we can invite people in here. If you've never seen a musical at Christ Chapel, we can't have enough seats in here. It's just, it packs the house. And so what we want you to do is we'd love for you to begin to pray for who you're going to begin to invite so that they might hear the gospel. This is a tool to, sh- to reach the lost. Fort Worth, we're at the gateway. We're at the gateway of the cultural center of the city. And so it makes sense that we would step forward and use the talents and abilities of all the people in our congregation that can sing and dance and use these gifts for the glory of God so that we can reach the lost. Amen? Amen. Good. Awesome. So what we want you to do is we want you to pray for those who you're going to invite this year to the summer musical. And then if you actually have those talents and abilities, we'd love to see them. I, w- I know I want Cody to be on the, in the musical for sure. Uh, we'd love to see you guys use those. So ta- if you can sing, dance, if you want to be in the background, if you'd like to be a tree, we would love to have you uh, come be a part of our musical. You can sign up on our website. We'd love for you to do that. Right now, though, I want to pray for our vision to reach the 800,000, and then I want to pray for this offering today. So let's pray today. God, we're so privileged to be here in a place that gets to offer things like this, in a place that's connected to so many ministries across the world that are serving your namesake. Lord, we beg of you this morning, use today's offering, use the offering of Christ Chapel today to bring your name even more glory, that more people might get to say, that's the true King of kings, that's the true Lord of lords. Whatever it takes, Lord, use this offering for your namesake. We love you. Amen. Christ Chapel, we're going to start off with one of my favorite things I ever get to say to you, and that is please open your Bibles. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be in verses 19 to 24. Uh, Also, you'll need a copy of your sermon notes. And I know that as you pull out a copy of your sermon notes, you are noticing two different color sheets of paper, and I want to explain what those are for, uh, because they have everything to do with Easter upcoming. And so the first thing that I want to to say is, uh, please go ahead and make those uh, reservation reminders or make those plans uh, to worship with us at one of our Easter celebrations. Easter is a full uh, week. As you've already heard, we have a Seder meal that we'd love for you to take part in that explains the significance of the Passover elements and how they relate to the Easter story. Uh, Wonderful teaching, very rich, enriches your worship for Easter, uh, certainly. But also we have live Good Friday services at all of our campuses. So want you to join us for one of those Good Friday services. And then we have Easter services on Saturday and Sunday at all of our campuses. And here's what I'm going to request. As you think about making plans, uh, if you call Christ Chapel home, would you please consider coming on Saturday to one of our Saturday experiences? We hope to host a lot of guests and they traditionally come on Sunday morning. If that works for you and your plans to come on Saturday, I think that would be a great gift to offer someone else a place place to sit, a parking spot for them when they come uh, on Sunday. So please consider that uh, for the Christ Chapel family. Now speaking of those guests who will come, here's the significance of the two sheets of paper. 
uh, we have asked you since September to be praying for two people that you would share the good news of Jesus Christ with. That's what these pieces of paper represent are those two people that you want to pray for and hopefully even invite, get an opportunity to invite to Easter. So here's how we'd like for you to participate. What we'd like for you to do is to write down the name of one person on one sheet of paper and the other person on the other sheet of paper. Then outside of each of your venues, there's an Easter installation where you will roll up the sheet of paper and you'll place it in the installation. Nobody will see the names or anything like that. Only you will know the name that is there. But that will be representative of all of the folks that we are praying for uh, this Easter season. Because we want to join you in praying for those folks as we continue to try to reach those in our own backyard who do not know or walk with Jesus. At the end or by Easter weekend, as everybody puts those in, that will provide the Easter kind of backdrop. Uh, the mosaic that we use where you have for so many years have taken pictures with your family on Easter weekend, which is just a really cool connection. And so we want to be praying for those folks this Easter, and that's what these represent. There's certain colors that go with certain numbers and stuff. You can see all of that uh, when you go out to those Easter installations. But please, you can do that today. You can do that throughout the week. You can do it next Sunday. But please participate so that we can be praying alongside you. I know our staff is going to have our staff meeting in in front of that so that we can be praying for those folks and be praying for you. Okay, now transitioning to today, I don't know any of you watching uh, March Madness or have been watching March Madness, uh, uh, go St. Peter's Peacocks, woohoo! Uh, but uh, I was watching some, some of the basketball and saw a commercial that I think debuted actually at the Super Bowl and it's an Expedia commercial, you know, they book travel and things, and it's Ewan McGregor, if you haven't seen it, and it's almost like he's walking through a backstage set, and there's all this stuff that he's walking through, and that's actually the first word of the entire commercial is, he says, stuff. We all love stuff. And he says, and he admits, and there's some great stuff out there. There's some great stuff out there. But he asked this really uh, probing question. And he said, but at the end of, the, end of our life, are we going to really regret the things that we didn't buy? You know, are we going to regret not having a thinner TV? Are we going to regret not buying a sportier SUV? Are we going to regret not buying a smarter smartphone? Great, great questions that he asked there. And then he says at, at the end of it, are we going to regret the things that we didn't buy or are we going to regret the places that we didn't go? Now, certainly it's a commercial for Expedia, which I'm giving them pub right now, uh, you know. But I think he's bringing up some, some great questions because at, at its core, the principle that he's bringing up is a return on investment. He's bringing up this concept of ROI, and I'm no financial expert, but we all, if you've ever spent money, you understand what ROI is. You want a good return on whatever you've invested, on whatever you've paid for. And that return can be uh, different things. If you Certainly, if you actually uh, invest, literally, you want X amount of return on the money you invested. Or you just, you paid for a meal. You want a good return. You want a good meal. You want a good value. You want to be full. You want to have, uh, you want it to taste good. It doesn't matter how you use that money. We all want a good ROI, a good return on our investment. But what I've realized is there's a second kind of ROI in our world. And everybody's experienced that one too. And that is regret on investment. Where you've paid for something, you've paid for a meal, and it stunk. It wasn't what you had hoped for. It wasn't what you expected. You go to this nice, fancy restaurant, and they give you this very petite portion size, and you're like, is that it? Well, they put a little leafy green on top, you know, with tweezers, and that made it really expensive. You know, you go, no. That's a regret on my investment. There's two kinds of ROI. 
We all want the return. We don't want the regret. But guess what? We're not the only ones who want the good return. Jesus wants you to have a good return on your investment too. And that's what we're going to talk about today because it's tied. Your return is tied to understanding upside down economics. And so we're going to continue in our series, Upside Down, as we walk through this gospel of Matthew. And remember, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is turning every area of our lives upside down. Everything that we thought we should do, we should do it this way. We should think about it this way. We should behave this way. He goes, no, 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 no. It's opposite. It, 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 it goes deeper. It's, it's different than what you expected. And he goes through all of these different areas of, of our life, whether it's what we feel, it's how we interact with one another, it's how we pray, as Ted talked about, did a great job last week. He, he goes through every single area, and today he's going to hit on an area that is common to men and women everywhere, and that is money. Now I know as soon as I bring up the topic of money, people go back, <laughs> You, you go, whoa, Cody, why are you talking about this? Well, first, I'm talking about this because Jesus is talking about it. And you say, then why is Jesus talking about it? Well, first, Jesus is not talking about money because he needed money. Actually, fun fact, if you think about it, Jesus throughout the Gospels never took up an offering. Ever. Ever. He's not talking about money because he needs your money. In fact, he's talking about money because money is a great indicator of which kingdom you're living for. That's why he's talking about it. He talks about money more than he talks about hell. He talks about money more than he talks about prayer and faith combined. Because we interact with it every day. And the way we handle it either propels us toward a kingdom to come or it locks us into the kingdom that's here and is fading. And that's why he brings it up so often because we interact with it on a daily basis and daily we get a choice. Are we going to get a good return on, on our investment or are we going to regret our investment? And so that's what we're going to talk about today in these particular verses, verses 19 uh, to 24. Now what I want to say, if you will give me just a moment, I want to give Cody's caveats, okay? Cody's caveats. Three very quick things. First, I do not get a commission off of sermons. And praise God for that because I have preached some stinkers. And so I'm super thankful but I, the, my, my, my motives are as pure as I think they can be through prayer, okay? I don't get anything if, if, if you give because you apply these principles. Second, I don't know what you give. And praise God for that. I don't want to know what you give. That, that is something that is with our finance department. I don't ask names. I don't ask amounts. I don't, I don't get any of that information, nor do I want it ever. Third caveat is the things that I'm going to teach you uh, is almost this 101 class. And I just want you to know that Jen and I apply these same principles to our family. So I'm not asking you or teaching you anything to do that we don't apply to ourselves. Okay? So those are the caveats here. Now let's start going through these new economic lessons, this new 101 that Jesus teaches, this kingdom economics, this upside down economics. And the first principle that he teaches is first, upside down economics teaches you to invest in what you cannot withdraw. And I know that is super weird. That, that immediately the way that we say that, that sounds different than the ways that we invest today. If you make investments today or you put your money into a bank or, or, or whatever, into a portfolio, a, a mutual fund, you can always draw that out. You can always liquidate that, that money. You can make withdrawals now. But Jesus is introducing almost a new kind of bank that you can't make withdrawals in right now. Look at verses 19 to 21. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus introduces this new uh, kingdom banking system where you can only make deposits. And that's, that, that sounds very scary. But the reason why he introduces that is because in that bank, in his bank, those investments are secure. They don't, they don't change. They don't rust or decay. You see, what he compares it to here are things that do decay. There are moth uh, it, it destroys. Uh, I'll explain what that word is there in just a moment. But what he says is, don't store up for yourselves tangible treasures here on earth. Don't store up for yourselves just things you can see, just things that you can touch. Because those things that you can see and, and touch, those things break. Those things get old. Those things decay. Those things fade away. Now, I want to, to say this other caveat. I guess here's another caveat. Is if you look biblically at how we're, we're called to handle money, you are called to save. It's okay, biblically, to save money. Biblically, you should take, use your money to take care of your relatives. Biblically, it says that we can enjoy the good gifts that God has given us. So it's, it's okay to have resources. God wants to use those resources for himself. What he doesn't want is us hoarding those resources. That's what he's speaking against here. Because the picture that he's given is this person that has hoarded different resources. The reason why he talks about moths is because uh, back in those times, people actually handed down expensive garments. That, that was a, a, a sign of wealth is what you wore. And so they would hand those down through the generations. And he says moths can certainly, just a tiny little moth can begin to destroy that very valuable garment. Or he talks about rust. And, and this rust is an interesting word. It's a word that, that means uh, decay, not just corrosion. But that word rust can apply even to mice taking out crops. It can even refer to teeth decaying. It's kind of this idea that everything will fade. Everything will, will go away. That's why he says don't store up only for yourselves tangible treasures that you can touch or see because those things can be destroyed. And that word destroy means disfigure, disvalue, or disappear. It will all fade. One, one day it will all go poof. And we know that. We, we, we inherently know that if we sit and think about it. That when we die, we can't take anything with us. That one day, we will poof, disappear. But all those things that we value, the tangible things, poof, will be disconnected from. And he says, do not store up for yourself. That, that word do not uh, is actually in the present tense, which means stop. Stop. Storing up for yourselves treasures on earth. But instead, he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. As one of my buddies pointed out, I cannot find another place in scripture where we are called to be selfish. Store up for yourselves. You. You can. You can store up for yourself as much treasure as you want in heaven. Where he will repay. And so the illustration here is this. Invest your resources where you're guaranteed a lasting return. Invest your resources where you're guaranteed a lasting return. You see, I think what Jesus is, is talking about here, if I were to give this to a modern day analogy, what I would say is don't invest in only Monopoly money. I don't know how many of you like Monopoly. I personally hate Monopoly. 
I, you never want to play with me. Uh, first, I'm no fun, just in general. Second, I hate that game because I am so impatient. I am the person that starts the game and then by two rolls, I give away all my money and everything there and I ruin the game. People don't like playing with me. But when we invest only in treasures on earth, I want you to think about, it's like we're playing Monopoly. And we're investing in just this paper money. And you can get a lot of houses and a lot of hotels and you can own a lot of property and all those things. But guess what? There comes a time where somebody folds that up and puts it back into the box and that game means nothing. And that's the analogy that he's giving here is this, is, this is deeper than monopoly. This goes further beyond what you can see. And the things that you invest in heaven, that will get a return. Because guess what? Heaven is eternal. It lasts forever. And so those rewards in the monopoly, those last for however long the game lasts. But the rewards in heaven, those are eternal. Those last Forever, And you say, how do I store up treasures in heaven? It's giving of your resources to anything that's eternal. Certainly that means kingdom causes like, like our church. And just so you know, our church has an extensive vetting process that we go through to give to any organization. Uh, so that you know that your money is going to actual kingdom causes. But it's also giving to other ministries. Give to other ministries. Praise God. It's also giving when you feel led. When you see somebody in need and, and you are trusting the Lord and you're walking with the Lord and you feel prompted that, Lord, I feel like I need to help in this way. Go for it. Do it. When you handle your money like you're living for eternal things, that shows that's where your heart is. That's why he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your money is, your heart is. Where your heart is, your money goes. It, it's always that way. So if you want to relocate your heart, put your money there. Your heart will follow. If your heart is in heaven, then that's where your money should go. If your heart is in eternal things, then that's where your God-given resources should go. That's where you get a return, and that's the, that's the place that is secure. You can't make withdrawals now. You can only make deposits, but when you deposit, you will experience a return on your investment that you will not regret. Proverbs 19, 17 says, whoever is generous to the poor, think about this, lends to the Lord, and he, that means the Lord, will repay him or her for their deed. The Lord will repay in eternity. The Lord will repay. It's as if, when you give to kingdom causes, it's as if you're giving to the Lord. When you honor him with your treasures, as that word is here, it's as if you're giving to him. Fun Matthew connection, fun for Cody Pastor, connection here uh, with that word treasure. Do you do you know where the last time is that we saw this word treasure? It's in Matthew chapter 2 when the magi come to the, to the manger-ish. They come later than the manger, but I'm just trying to set the scene for you. They come and they offer gold, frankincense, myrrh, their treasures as unto Jesus. That's the last time we saw this. That's the picture, is that they weren't going to hoard those resources for themselves. They were going to offer it to a baby. What's the baby going to do with that? It's up to them. But it's as unto the Lord. That's what he has here. Whenever we're generous to the poor, it's as if we are giving to the Lord. So invest your resources where you're guaranteed a lasting return. The second principle of up, down, upside down economics is this. Uh, economics teaches that your investments follow your attention. Your investments follow your intention. Your attention, sorry. Now, I'll read these next two verses, verses 22 and 23, and many people think these are uh, out of context, but I don't think they are, if uh, you'll let me explain. Verse 22 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So, if your eye is 
healthy, uh, or if your eye is good, is another way you can translate that word, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light, is in, uh, the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What Jesus is saying here is what you look at shines a light on what you're going to go toward. Right? Thinking of the moth, we are the moth to the flame. What, what you illuminate, what gets your attention is what you orient your life around. And the words that he uses here of a healthy or a good eye and a bad eye, he says the eye is the lamp, okay? So the eye illuminates. It gives light to. And don't we always want light ahead of us where we're walking? If you get up in the middle of the night, you want a light ahead of you so you can see where you're going. He says this, if the eye is good, then it shines that, that light on where you're supposed to be going. That word good, a good eye, uh, can actually also be translated a generous eye. A generous eye. A generous eye illuminates opportunities of kingdom opportunities. The evil eye, the evil eye means a selfish eye. It means, it means a miserly eye. And he says, if you have a good eye, the eye is the lamp of the body. And a light shines two ways. If your eye is good and looking to be generous, it shines a light on those opportunities for you to be generous for kingdom causes. But it also shines internally, illuminating the, the right and sincere intentions in your heart. That you're living for the right things. It's a two-way lamp. And that's why he says if, if your eye is dark, unhealthy, man, doesn't that reveal a darkness in you? How deep is that darkness? That you only are miserly. You only think about the things that are, are here. You're not living for what is ahead. Because this kingdom will end. And he says, so that's why he wants you to invest in the things to come. But he wants you to see those opportunities now to invest in those eternal opportunities. You see, focus on eternal things with what you give attention to that enlighten immediate eternal opportunities. You see, I think there are immediate eternal opportunities if we just open our eyes to them. If we have an eye for generosity, being generous with the things that God has given us, we can see those opportunities. And you say, how, how do I even start? Here, here's how you start. Um, first, start with prayer. Pray. God, what do you want me to do with this? How are there opportunities that you've put in front of me today in order to be generous? So first, pray. Second, participate. Um, so if you always pray and never participate, you're not answering your own prayer. Okay? God will answer that prayer. He'll show you those things. Follow through and, and, and actually participate in that opportunity and you'll be so glad that you did you'll see amazing things happen when you engage in the things of god you see we all want those god stories but we don't want to participate in faith in those god adventures <laughs> if you want the god story you want the god adventure then participate in the things that god wants you to and that's why we've got to keep our eye on eternal things uh, colossians chapter 3 says if then, I love this if then statement, if then you have been raised with Christ, if we say we are living for a kingdom to come, that we believe that we will be resurrected with him to eternal life because of his grace and goodness and generosity of sending his own son for us, if you believe that, then seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Seek those things, give attention to, focus on those things, pursue those things. Where he is seated at the right hand of God, this is an easy memory verse for you. I know we're sending you one tomorrow, but set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Give those attention to those eternal things. Third, upside down economics teaches that money 
is always a cruel master. This is the third lesson that he gives us in these verses that he wants us to understand that if we live for the kingdom of this world, it will be a cruel master. And many of you right now uh, are probably thinking, Cody, money is not my master. Okay, fair. But let me tell you how I've thought about this as I've studied uh, this, this past week. What I think of it as, how many of us, and I'm guilty of this, have said, if I only had more money, then, you know, I could take that vacation. Then our family would be better off. Then I can get the car fixed. Then I can get, and all of those things. Now, certainly, money in our world makes for an easier life. I'm not saying that it doesn't do that. But if money is our ultimate problem solver, then we are the ones that have the problem. Because money is not just a problem solver, it's a problem creator. Okay, notorious be mo money, mo problems. All right? I had to throw that in there. Jesus says the same thing. He got it from him. Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. This is an emphatic statement. You cannot. It is impossible to serve both God and money. One will always be the master. And, and, that, and, and that's very important to understand because he's not saying that both are employers. Because there are people that can have two jobs. And you go, I can, I, can, I can juggle two jobs here, you know. I work this shift and then I go to that shift. And he's not saying two employers. He says two masters that don't share. You, you are theirs. Always living under their rule and their reign. And he says, you cannot live under God and under money. You're going to love one and hate the other or despise the other. And he's using uh, hyperbolic language here. He's using hyperbole. But he says, you can't. You can't serve one another. You're going to love one and hate the other. And the, the way that he talks about it, it's interesting. The word that is used for money here is actually, it references an Aramaic word, mammon. Now, mammon goes all the way back to Old Testament times, to the Chaldeans, and they had a, a, a god who was the money god, and his name was mammon. That's what he's saying here, is there's two different gods. You serve mammon as this is going to solve all my problems. This is what I find security in. This is what I'm going to trust and it's going to end up causing more problems for you than it is solving for you. If that is what you place your trust in. You see, who your master is determines how you handle your money. If money is your God, you will serve money. If God, are one, the one true God... Father, Son, Holy Spirit is your God, then you don't serve money, you steward money. And there's a big difference between serving it and stewarding it. You see, what we're called to do is steward our resources for God's sake so our resources don't enslave us. Steward your resources for God's sake so your resources don't enslave you. See, this concept of steward, and, and we've talked about it before, but just to reiterate, this idea of stewardship means that you are given something that is not yours. It's given to you by someone else to be responsible for, to manage in the way that the owner wants you to manage it. And that's really important because that, that enlightens me to understand that the things that I have, as I go home and I drive home and I, and I open the garage door, every, all that junk in there is not mine. 
That, that's stuff that the Lord has given to me that I am called to steward. Now, part of stewarding that is using it for the good of my family or anybody else. Using it for his purposes. You see, that's something else that is important to understand if we are called to steward our resources is that everything we are given has a purpose. And we're not the ones that give it purpose. God is the one that gives a purpose to it. And that's why we've got to ask him, God, why did you give this to me? Why, why, why do you want me to have this? Is this something you want me to enjoy? Praise God. That's awesome. Is it something you want me to share? Praise God. Is it something you want me to give away? Praise God. Because guess what? It's all his. And when I leave this world, I don't take it with me. We're just called to steward those things now. And the way that we steward things here determines how we store up things there. That's what he's calling us to do. Because if we don't steward money and let it pass freely through our hands for God's purposes, then it will enslave us. And there is no greater warning passage that shows this, uh, this danger explicitly then 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. I want to read this slowly so this sinks in. But godliness with contentment is great gain. See, we think contentment comes from more money. And it doesn't. Godliness with contentment. What does contentment mean? He explains it here. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing, with these things and godliness, we'll be content. If we just have what we need, then praise God. But, here's the warning. But those who desire, it's their pursuit. It's what they dream about. It's what they think about. It's what they orient their lives around to be rich. They fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, the love, the hoarding, the investing only in the monopoly game, in the here and now, is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, this insatiable craving, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. A great warning that if we make money our master, we will end up serving it. And it will end up stealing our life. You see, if you've heard nothing else, Please, 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 I want you to hear this. And it's a statement that is at the bottom of your sermon notes. Don't miss this. God wants generosity for you as much as he wants generosity from you. He wants it as much for you because that means if you are generous, that means you are experiencing the free life that he wants you to experience that you're not enslaved to money. You're not enslaved by these insatiable cravings, these desires that you'll never fulfill, that plunge you into ruin and destruction, that pierce you with many pangs. He wants it as much for you as he wants it from you. See, God doesn't need an offering. God wants you, though, to live in a generous way that shows that you're living for a kingdom to come. You see, to live freely... Give freely, because the more you try to hold on to money, the more it will take hold of you. You see, the way that we handle money is an indicator for the kingdom we are living for. Let's live for the kingdom to come, not the kingdom that will fade away. Amen? Amen. Uh, God, we thank you for your word. We th I thank you, Lord God, that you want this for us. Lord, you were generous to us by sending your one and only son. There wasn't another son for you to keep for yourself. This wasn't something that you would share 
Lord, it's one that you gave freely to us, generously, so that we could experience abundant life, eternal life with you forever. And so, Lord, my prayer, Lord, give us attention, eyes to see, ears to hear, Lord, the opportunities that you have. Yes, so that we can store up treasures in heaven, but so that we could invest in eternal things that won't just change our eternity, but Lord, it will change eternity for those who yet to know you. And so help us please, Lord Jesus, to be stewards of the things that you've given us for your sake. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Pastor Cody's words are uh, an encouraging reminder, but they're hard. These are hard things to process and, and to think through at times. You know, for me personally, in my journey, uh, growing up, finances were always, you know, a thing in question. But, you know, whether you have a lot of money or a little money or in between, uh, this is the truth in what Pastor Cody is sharing, that if we are going to truly serve the Lord, if he is going to be our master, if we are going to have these lives uh, that are an offering to him, then we have to hold the treasures here on earth loosely and not with a clenched fist. And so um, if you'll stand with us, we're gonna respond and worship. You may not know this song, uh, but I just say reflect on the words. Uh, let it be something to guide your heart. Let it be a prayer for you. And when you catch it, you can sing with us. sing these lyrics as an outward expression to match inwardly what our hearts were designed for, that we would surrender all things to our Father. So I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. Lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down is for you. So I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down for you. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down is for you. Oh 
Wow. Amen. Uh, it, it is, uh, thank you for participating in worship. I, I, I genuinely just mean that. I, I don't think I've ever uh, heard the sanctuary that loud uh, than the way you guys sang today. And man, it's just, it's a huge encouragement. Thank you. If you're a guest, so glad that you came today. Thanks for spending a part of your weekend with us. You're around people who radically love Jesus, and I know that they will radically love you too. We'd love to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, please go out into the uh, great room. You'll find a screen that says next steps. Uh, there you'll, you'll meet a pastor or a staff member. They can answer any questions that you might have. But we want to give you some next steps of connecting with Jesus, more, or maybe even some next steps of how you can connect to Christ Chapel. Uh, also, if you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray for you uh, down here. So just uh, wander down after the service. We'll have some folks here down front that would love to pray for you. Speaking of prayer, please do not forget. Uh, please write that down. Write down those names. Uh, roll them up. That uh, Easter install is right outside. Uh, take your time. Roll it up. Put it in there so that we can all be praying, and you can be praying, and you can be invited because we want to reach those in our own backyard. We're not focused on the monopoly game of the here and the now. We're focused on what God is doing in the here and now as it leads into eternity. Amen? God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week.